thanks everyone for coming uh, here to listen to this uh, this evening. So, you know, the uh, the overall topics uh, for today's talk would be the histopathology of arteriovenous malformations or AVMs for short, the epidemiology or you know, who gets it and other statistics like that, the diagnosis, how do we diagnose AVMs and how do we talk about AVMs? And finally, the natural history. Um, I will leave uh, the management topics uh, for the next uh, session. So let's start with a case. Uh, this is a 22 year old man who presented with extensor posturing and a fixed and dilated right pupil. So basically, young, young man who came in uh, and was herniating. And up here in the upper left-hand corner, you can see the uh, head CT, a non-contrast head CT with a large uh, hemorrhage, which is the bright spot there. It's a large intraparenchymal hemorrhage with a little bit of uh, intraventricular hemorrhage. This is a CTA that was done to evaluate the cause of the hemorrhage. And you can see here what looks like a tangle of blood, blood vessels, and that's the AVM. So this patient was taken emergently to the operating room for evacuation of the hematoma and the resection of the AVM. This is an intraoperative photo. You can't see it real well uh, because the AVM is a little bit deep. It's, it's underneath there. And at seven months post-op, he did very, very well. Despite presenting in a deep coma, he was basically intact except for a little bit of decreased left arm sensation and a little bit of decreased fine motor movement of the left hand. So this kind of gives you the gist of a typical presentation of a patient with an AVM. Now, AVMs are one of the four major types of vascular malformations that are found in the brain. The most common type of vascular malformation would be a venous malformation. So these are things such as developmental venous anomalies, for example. And that um, prevalence there is about 3% of the population to um, less common things like cavernous malformations, capillary telangiectasias, Arterial venous malformations are actually the least common uh, or the le least prevalent of the vascular malformations, making up roughly 0.1% of the population. Although the number really varies quite widely, depending on which uh, paper you look at, anywhere from 0.005% to 0.6% of the population. Now, what is an AVM? An AVM is a high flow vascular malformation that consists of direct connection between arteries and veins. Now, as you know, arteries uh, in a normal organ, arteries become smaller arterioles and finally, finally become capillaries uh, to feed the organ before they uh, come together again to form veins. In an AVM, there is no capillary bed. So you, ha you have a direct connection between arteries and veins through these very dilated dysplastic vessels that form what's called the nidus. So the nidus is the tangle of vessels that you see. Now let's go over, and in this nidus, not only is there no capillary, there's also no brain, so no brain parenchyma. Here's some uh, basic terminology when we people talk about AVM. So we talk about the nidus, which is the actual AVM. There's the feeding artery. These are the vessels that feed the AVM, meaning they bring blood to the AVM. And then there's the draining vein, which brings blood away from the AVM. Now, there are other things, uh, entities nearby, which you may hear about when people talk about AVM. These are antisage arteries. These are blood vessels that eventually feed the brain, but they also send little branches to the AVMs like these. Uh, there are uh, basically unrelated vessels that happen to pass by. These are just adjacent arteries. Feeding arteries, on the other hand, end in the AVM, so they don't go on to feed anything else. So basic terminology. Now to understand what um, the histopathology of an AVM, uh, you should, let's review some histology of normal arteries and normal veins. So an artery, has three, and veins too, have three layers. Um, the, these pictures are actually pictures of the peripheral arteries. So the, the intracranial arteries actually are slightly different, but it's close enough. You have the intima, which is um, 
made of endothelial cells. You have an internal elastic lamina layer, the media, which has smooth muscle cells, and the adventitia, which has fibroblasts, nerve cells, base of sorum, et cetera. In a vein, veins are pretty similar, uh, except the smooth muscle cell layer is thinner, and you don't have the internal elastic lamina. Uh, and just as a side note, the external elastic uh, lamina is only present extracranially, so the intracranial vessels don't have that. So these are just a couple of H and E stains of an artery here and a vein. Now in an AVM, uh, in fact, even though we're talking about feeding arteries and draining veins and dilated vessels that are really quite large, um, larger than any other, could they could be larger than any other intracranial vessels. Yet the architecture is basically the same thing as a capillary. There's an endothelial cell layer and nothing else. There's no smooth muscle cell layer. And it, despite the fact that the size of these vessels can be quite large. And by large, I mean, they can be as large as, you know, several millimeters. So these are really huge vessels. Uh, other things that differentiate AVM vessels from normal arteries and veins are inflammatory cells. So in areas of microhemorrhages, and many AVMs do have areas of microhemorrhages, this is not the same thing as a ruptured AVM. They just do have small pockets of bleeding within the AVM, even in an unruptured AVM. But there are lymphocytes that gather around these areas. And also within the lumen uh, of the uh, AVM vessels themselves, you can see many neutrophils that would basically uh, adhere to the luminal surface of the AVM vessels. So that's the histopathology. Now, what do we know about the pathogenesis uh, of AVMs? First of all, AVMs are thought to occur, thought to be congenital. So you're born with them for the most part. The, uh, they are found um, in children, in babies even. There are genetic disorders that are associated with AVMs, um, one of which is a her hereditary hemorrhagic uh, telangiectasia or osler weber randu syndrome. This is a rare autosomal dominant disorder where vascular abnormalities can occur in the skin, the mucous membrane, the liver, the lungs, and the brain. Uh, patients with HHT or, or the hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia can have multiple AVMs. In fact, they can develop AVMs uh, after birth. So there are cases, uh, case reports of patients with HHT who would get angiograms with, you know, so many AVMs and you get it um, a year or two later and they, they develop new ones. This is not typical of um, most AVMs. Most AVMs are sporadic and therefore genetic counseling is not necessary. They are usually um, solitary. Most people do not have multiple AVMs. You really just have that one. And more very recently, really only in the last couple of years uh, with the advances in gene genetics, it's found that it's been found that somatic mutations are responsible or at least are found in the majority of AVMs, uh, particularly somatic mutations in CRAS. And CRAS mutations induce the MAP kinase um, ERG signaling pathway in the brain endothelial cells, which eventually lead to angiogenesis and migration of the endothelial cells. And this, was, this is thought to contribute to the pathogenesis of AVMs. But there's still a lot of unknowns about how AVMs form and why they form. So let's move on to epidemiology. The average age at presentation for AVM is 34. And this has to do with the fact that they are largely congenital and therefore the age of presentation is going to be younger than say something else like diabetes, for example. Um, roughly equal male, uh, female predominance, just slightly more male. And importantly, the presentation, half the patients with AVMs present with hemorrhage and a quarter present with seizures and the rest are found incidentally. The important thing about this is that the outcome after hemorrhage is quite poor with a 10% mortality and 40% uh, poor outcome one month after hemorrhage. How do we diagnose AVMs? AVMs can be diagnosed using different uh, 
various imaging modalities, including an MRI. So here on the left here, you see an MRI. You can see the AVM as sort of a haze. Um, a CTA, you can see a little bit better here. Uh, you know, you can see the brain less well. You can see the vessels a little bit better. And then on the other end of the spectrum is an angiogram where you don't see the brain at all and you just see the vessels. The uh, pros and cons of each, and it is important to get different imaging modality to really fully evaluate an AVM. M MRI will allow you to localize the AVM so you know if it's an, in an important part of the brain or not. Something called eloquence, so we can you can determine uh, based on the location on an MRI whether an, uh, the AVM is an elegant part of the brain. Whereas an angiogram will show you autovascular uh, anatomy that's associated with AVM. And we'll uh, go over that uh, in a little bit more detail. Now, when you talk about an AVM, when you see a patient with an AVM, uh, you need to be able to to, to basically describe some of the main features, and that includes the size and the location of the AVM, what's feeding the AVM, meaning feeding arteries, venous drainage of the AVM, and finally, if there are any associated aneurysms. And I'm just gonna mention the Spessler Martin grading system, even though at the next session, you will hear about this too, because when you talk to a neurosurgeon, invariably, if you talk about an AVM, somebody will ask you, what is the special Martin grade of the AVM? Uh, this is a grading system that that was developed by Dr. Spessler and Martin uh, back in 1986, so a few decades ago, where points were given to an AVM uh, for size. You get one, two, or three points depending on the size being less than three centimeters, between three and six centimeters, or greater than six centimeters. Eloquence, you get a point for eloquence, and one point for drainage into the deep venous drainage, uh, deep venous system. Now, it's not particularly particularly relevant to our talk today, uh, except it's good to be able to mention the special Martin grading whenever you talk about an AVM. And the reason it's not particularly relevant to the natural history is because this grading system was meant to um, assess surgical risks, which we're not talking about today. So let's go through some examples of um, AVMs and how we describe them. This is a 66 year old man who presented with headache and lethargy. And you can see here, there's a hemorrhage in the temporal lobe. You can see some calcifications here and AVMs are sometimes associated with calcifications. The, um, and so how do we describe this AVM? So first of all, size and location. So this is a two centimeter right temporal AVM. And to describe the, the uh, vascular structure, you would need something like an angiogram. So this is a video of the angiogram. This is a uh, right internal carotid artery injection. This is an anterior posterior, uh, posterior view, AP view. You can see here, and the thing to know about an angiogram is that this is basically a movie. You start in the arterial phase. So right now you see the internal carotid artery going up. And as you the movie runs on, here's the middle, here are the middle cerebral arteries. They feed the AVM, which is this tangle right here. So you see the AVM in the arterial phase of this. As I run the movie a little further, you start to see other, you start to see other things. So this is a draining vein. This is the basal vein of Rosenthal. Yeah, it's hard to see here, but you'll see on the lateral view, there's also um, draining veins there. The important thing to note here is that you are seeing the draining veins in the arterial phase. So here you're still seeing the artery, the internal carotid artery, but you see veins that are coming from the AVM. Normally, you need to go through arteries, then capillaries, and finally the venous phase to see the, the veins. So this is uh, termed early venous shunting. So whenever you see early venous shunting uh, in an angiogram, it tells you you have some sort of vascular malformation like an AVM. 
this is a lateral view. So here again, this is a internal carotid artery going into the middle cerebral artery here. The AVM, the draining veins from the AVM. Uh, some of the basal vein, vein of Rosenthal, you can't see quite as well uh, in this picture, but you see the, uh, the drainage into the vein of LaBay into the transverse sigmoid sinus here. And again, this is early. This is still in the arterial phase. You're seeing all these veins. The actual capillary phase doesn't happen until right about there. And finally, you see the normal veins in the venous phase very late. So the way I would describe this AVM, therefore, is a two centimeter right temporal AVM that's fed by the right MCA and right PCA. And I didn't point that out, but with venous drainage into the basal vein of Rosenthal, the superior sagittal sinus, and the transverse sigmoid uh, sinus. And there are no associated aneurysms. Okay. So let's um, just do one more example before we uh, go on. This is a 51 year old woman who presented with an aphasia. And so you can see here uh, there's a hemorrhage, an intraparenchymal hemorrhage in the left temporal parietal lobe. The, uh, the CTA shows an associated AVM, it looks like a tangle of vessels. So, how do we describe this? Uh, first of all, size and location is about one and a half centimeters on the left temporal parietal area. So, let's look at the movie again of the AVM. So this is a left internal carotid artery injection. You see, again, you see this angle of vessels, the AVM arising in the uh, arterial phase of this angiogram. And we'll come back to this to look at the, uh, actually, we just, uh, I'll just show it to you here. This is uh, the middle cerebral artery. Now, you don't have anything to compare to here, but these vessels are very large. Usually, by the time you get this distal, um, vessels become very small. And this is because of the high flow to the AVM. You will often see very large intracranial uh, vessels that are feeding arteries to the AVM. Because of this high flow, many AVMs are associated with what's called feeding artery aneurysm. So here we have uh, this little left here. This is a middle cerebral artery aneurysm, and it's considered a feeding artery aneurysm to the AVM. And just like we saw before, we look at the uh, lateral view here. You see the AVM a little bit better, MCA feeding it, and you see here the draining veins right in the middle of the arterial phase, draining into here, the superior sagittal sinus, and also right here into the basal vein of Rosenthal, uh, vein of Galen, straight sinus there, the deep venous system. So the way I would describe this AVM is that it's a 1.4 centimeters of uh, centimeter left temporal parietal AVM that's fed by the left by left MCA branches and drainage into the basal vein of Rosenthal and superior sagittal sinus. And it has an associated left MCA feeding artery aneurysm. Okay, so those are sort of a basic terminology whenever we talk about AVMs. So, what about the characteristics of AVMs? Uh, AVMs can be considered uh, superficial. So, you know, intuitively, these are cortical. Deep would be in the uh, brainstem, basal ganglia such areas. We'll go over more detail about that in a little bit. Most AVMs, about 75% are superficial, about a quarter of them are deep, and but not too many have aneurysms. About 20% have some sort of associated aneurysms, uh, but only 10% would have a feeding artery aneurysm. And the uh, venous drainage, uh, deep venous drainage into the deep system, such as the uh, vein of Galen, basal vein of Rosenthal, about half of them have deep venous drainage. Now, most, um, about 40% of AV, AVMs are considered small. Now, small, again, came from the special Martin grading system, where small is uh, considered less than three centimeters. But in any case, these are sort of the general, it will give you a rough uh, idea of what a typical AVM would look like. 
Now hemorrhage, as we saw earlier, is the most common presentation of ADMs. About half the patients present with hemorrhage. They're usually intrapharenchymal, which makes sense because the AVM lives in the actual uh, brain, not in the subarachnoid space like aneurysms, not in the ventricles. So bleeding from AVM is going to be, for the most part, be intrapharenchymal. Once in a while, you see AVM bleeding that uh, is intraventricular, but that really only happens because a portion of the AVM happens to reach into the uh, the ventricle, or the bleeding is so large that it broke into the ventricle. Uh, subarachnoid hemorrhages can also occur from AVMs, but typically these occur from the aneurysms that are associated with the AVM and not the AVM itself. The one very important thing to remember, even if you don't remember anything else from this lecture, uh, is that if you see an intraparenchymal hemorrhage in a young person and you know, that there's no exact age cutoff, but I would consider anyone under 50 uh, in this category. So an intraparenchymal hemorrhage in a young person is basically a ruptured AVM until proven otherwise. So if you ever see a young person with an ICH, you'd have to get vascular imaging to work it up and not assume that it is a, and, it, and this is a, Spontaneous, by the way, we're not talking about traumas. Uh, you can't assume that it's hypotensive, for example. Okay. Now, what about the natural history of AVMs? Uh, because hemorrhage is really devastating, as you saw earlier, high morbidity, high mortality, and half the, people, half the patients with AVMs present with a hemorrhage. So when you talk about the natural history of the AVMs, the thing that most physicians and patients are gonna worry about is the risk of hemorrhage. What factors affect the hemorrhage rate of an AVM in the absence of treatment? The hemorrhage rate uh, of you know, an AVM, basically of an unruptured AVM is about two to 4% a year. So if you see someone who came in with an incidental AVM, for example, or uh, seizures from an AVM, their risk of hemorrhage is 2 to 4% a year. Now, this is not very high, except since AVMs tend to occur in young people or get diagnosed in young people, you know that this 2 to 4% a year adds up uh, over the lifetime of the patient. Now, the things that people have thought about in terms of, you know, what affects the natural history of an AVM Prior hemorrhage uh, is one of the most important things. So that's how prior hemorrhage affect the hemorrhage rate. Well, it's been shown in a lot of um, studies, uh, retrospective or observational studies that the re-hemorrhage rate in the first year after an AVM hemorrhage is anywhere from six to 15%. So it is increased for sure, uh, you know, two to four times the baseline rate of hemorrhage. And a number of studies have been done to look at this uh, from the 80s to the 2000s, where uh, we get these statistics of the 2 to 4% uh, at baseline and 9 to 6 to 15% rehemorrhage rate. What about location? So, location, and I had mentioned earlier, and you see this in the Spessomartin gradings. Uh, oh, actually, not. Uh, and, you, and we mentioned it a little bit earlier in one of the slides. Uh, the location of an AVM can be superficial or deep. Uh, deep is defined as being in the brainstem, the deep cerebellum nuclei, the basal ganglia, the thalamus, and the corpus callosum. So for example, this is uh, an AVM that's located in the basal ganglia. So this is deep. Uh, here's one in the thalamus. This is also deep. Corpus callosum, uh, also considered, considered deep, makes sense, right? They're, they're not uh, superficial on the cortical surface there. And of course, the brainstem, definitely deep. Uh, what about aneurysms, like the hemorrhage risk? Uh, and although I kind of alluded to earlier, the, the types of aneurysms associated with an AVM are feeding RV aneurysms. These are flow-related aneurysms and also intranidal aneurysms and remote aneurysms. These are totally unrelated aneurysms that may be, say, 
in the other hemisphere, for example. So what's the difference? Feeding RV aneurysm, you saw in the example, these are aneurysms that occur on a vessel that feeds the AVM. In this particular case, uh, the vessel that's feeding the AVM is the anterior cerebral artery. So you have an anterior communicating artery aneurysm. So these, just like your regular aneurysms in a patient who doesn't have an AVM, have, can have a significant risk of hemorrhage uh, per year, depending on the characteristics of the aneurysm. But in addition, in an AVM, there is very high flow through the feeding artery. Uh, and so aneurysms in an AVM probably have even a higher risk of hemorrhage than your run of the mill aneurysm of the exact same shape and size. What about intranidal aneurysms? So these are aneurysms that occur within the AVM itself. This is a tiny AVM. You can see the blep there, which is an intranidal aneurysm. In this particular patient, it was this intranidal aneurysm that actually hemorrhaged um, and caused the AVM to rupture. Uh, what about pattern of venous drainage? Does that affect the hemorrhage risk? Uh, and just to define venous drainage uh, more clearly, superficial venous drainage uh, are basically things that drain to the superficial sinuses. And these are the superior sagittal sinus, the transverse sinus, the sigmoid sinus, and the cavernous sinus. The deep um, venous uh, system are considered internal cerebral veins. So these are all the things that drain the basal ganglia, thalamus, that sort of thing. Basal vein of Rosenthal, vein of Galen, and the precentral cerebellar vein, which um, as a reminder, drains into the vein of Galen. Now, a point uh, of uh, confusion sometimes occurs with the post, with AVMs in the posterior fossa, so in the cerebellum. So the only superficial uh, venous drainage in the posterior fossa would be cerebellar veins that drain directly into the straight sinus or, in the, or to the transverse sinus. So here's an example. This is an example of a superficial, uh, a, a superficial venous drainage. This is a vein of Trollard draining to the superior sagittal sinus. And this is an example of a, a very large AVM that's draining into very large uh, basal vein of Rosenthal in the vein of Galen. So this is a deep venous drainage system. What about special Martin grading? So before we Spend any more time on the Spetzel Martin grading? Uh, no, it does not affect hemorrhage risk. Remember, Spetzel Martin grading is only meant to assess surgical risk, not the natural history. Now, to look at the natural history, there was a landmark study that was done back in 2006 uh, that's usually refer, often referred to as the New York Island study. And this was a study that came out of uh, Columbia, where the authors looked at the effect of deep venous drainage, deep location on the risk of hemorrhage of an AVM. And as you can see, there's a huge gradient or differences in risk depending on what features there are. Um, here on the x-axis, you see no hemorrhage, meaning an unruptured AVM, hemorrhage meaning the AVM had presented with a hemorrhage. So even in a more superficial AVM with no deep venous drainage and no deep location, the risk of hemorrhage from an AVM that had previously ruptured is five times that of an unruptured AVM. However, as you move along this axis here, you see on the other end of the spectrum, an AVM that is uh, deep in location and has deep venous drainage, even if it were unruptured, already has an eightfold risk, a higher risk of hemorrhage than an AVM that has that's not deep and that has no deep, deep venous drainage. And even more so in the highest category here of an AVM that had previously ruptured is deep and has deep venous drainage. The risk of hemorrhage there is a 34 fold that of the lowest category of AVMs. And so you can see this fact, the features that we've talked about are very important in terms of understanding the natural history of an AVM. And this will become important when you counsel a patient in terms of treatment. The, uh, this is a meta-analysis that was done and 
in any case, this, this table is really meant to show you the results of the natural history study of a few large studies that were done in the 2000s. The, um, as you can see, the results aren't always consistent across the different studies. The typical things that people looked at are the things we talk about, prior hemorrhage, deep location, venous drainage, associated aneurysm, female sex, small size, older age. But uh, when a meta-analysis is done of all of these studies, what was found is that prior hemorrhage, deep location, exclusive deep venous drainage, and associated aneurysm are basically the main risk factors for rupture in terms of the natural history of an AVM. Uh, and unlike what uh, in the past were thought to be true or were controversial, there's no effect of the sex, the size of the AVM, or age uh, on the risk of rupture uh, of, the, of an AVM. Now, the uh, one another thing I just wanted to mention uh, is uh, seizures. Now, we've spent most of this uh, lecture so far talking about hemorrhage. And the reason, again, because hemorrhage is uh, the most common presentation for AVMs and also uh, the most morbid. Now, the second most common presentation uh, would be seizures and occurs in about 25% of patients. In patients with incidental AVMs, uh, in other words, they haven't ruptured and they haven't had a seizure before, the risk of seizures uh, within the first five years of diagnosis is about 8%. And of those who develop a seizure, the risk of developing epilepsy eventually is 58%, so quite high. Now, in those who present with hemorrhage or some sort of neurological deficit, the risk of seizure is even higher within five years, uh, it's 23%. Now, seizures or risk factors for seizures is not anywhere nearly as well studied as the risk factors for hemorrhage from AVM in terms of the natural history but possible risk factors for seizures are large size. So these things are almost the opposite of the risk uh, for hemorrhage. Large size, superficial venous drainage, uh, just because this will now irritate the more cortical areas, which are uh, you know, considered more epileptogenic location in the arterial border zone. So I just want to uh, wrap up by uh, just going over a few take home points. So when you see an AVM uh, or come across a patient with AVM, you will want to make sure to describe the size, the location, the feeding arteries, the venous drainage, and whether or not the uh, AVM has any associated aneurysms. Some uh, basic statistics to keep in the back of your mind, the bleeding risk of an AVM is about two to 4% a year. And the re-bleeding risk is about 6 to 15% in the first year after hemorrhage. Importantly, intraparenchymal hemorrhage, uh, intraparenchymal hemorrhage in a young person is an AVM until proven otherwise. And finally, uh, the, and just know this is from the natural history studies, factors that increase rupture risks of an AVM includes prior hemorrhage, deep location, exclusive deep venous drainage, and associated aneurysms. And that uh, concludes my talk. Thank you. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.